Thanks very much, and welcome to NYU Stern. It's always, uh, I was thinking this morning on the way over here, it's always so um, uh, satisfying to walk on, onto campus. And I hope some of you feel the satisfaction when you walk onto a campus. It's a place where you know, good is happening. I was, uh, I'm not teaching this semester. I'm already sort of jonesing for it. A bunch of uh, young people who are just trying to better themselves and get to study with people, uh, under people, and learn from people, and you'll hear from some of them today, who are, are literally just charged with pursuing the truth. And think about it, there's no other atmosphere that that happens in, where someone says, my job is to take this muscle in between, or this organ between the ears of you know, tomorrow's leaders, and just do my best to pursue the truth such that they might learn from that. And I was, I was trying to identify why I always feel pretty good walking on campus, and I think that's part of it. Uh, anyways, thank you for the hallmark moment there. So we'll, uh, in each of our updates of the four, our basic premise is the Apple, Amazon, Facebook, and Google have become more powerful than any entities in the world, maybe with the exception of China and the US, and that their influence is appreciated but underestimated. And in each one of these updates, we talk about, A, how they're doing and their victims. And the major theme for this talk this morning is that we think something really unusual is taking place or significant, and that is the four, Amazon, a Apple, Facebook, and Google, uh, one is pulling away. Uh, typically, it was those four going after befuddled prey in different sectors and sucking market cap from an old economy firm that was um, not keeping up with one of the four. And now what we're seeing is one of them is starting not only to go after different sectors, but going after the other three and is pulling the away. And this presentation is going to serve as the nexus to our kind of our next big body of work over the course of the next six or 12 months and frame the day in terms of what each of our sessions is going to be asking. And that is, what is your strategy for Amazon? And I believe that slowly but surely the four are transitioning to the one. I think Amazon is better positioned competitively than any firm uh, in recent history in terms of how dominant it is and how well set up it is. And it'll be interesting, and I invite all of our um, fellow colleagues here and scholars here to comment on whether they think that's true or not. So with that, these four. And if I had it to do over again, I would A, uh, take more English classes in college, and I would probably uh, pursue uh, some sort of um, uh, degree in evolutionary anthropology or just biology. Because at the end of the day, everything we do comes down to biology, and bus business mimics biology probably. If you want to understand uh, business, you just want to understand uh, biology. And these companies have effectively disarticulated who we are as a species, and then reassembled them in the form of a public company and created unbelievable economic uh, value. So what do we have? We have Google, which is God. You know, in modern society, our modern problems get bigger and bigger, our need for a super being is still there, yet as societies become more educated, as societies become wealthier, their trust in God and religious institution declines, which creates a vacuum, and Google is filling that vacuum. One in six queries to Google have never been asked before. Think of a rabbi, a priest, a cleric, a scholar, a coach who has so much credibility that one in six questions posed to that individual have never been asked before in the history of mankind. And you're going to quickly figure out that Google is the most credible source of information in the world. You send up divine questions, or you send up questions hoping for some divine answer. Will my kid be all right? And hope that there's some sort of intervention processing and sends back an answer that's more credible than any answer you would get asking anybody else. And now it's symptoms and treatment of croup, and we get answers back that are more credible than any other source in the world. Who do you ask for information before your doctor, before your psychotherapist, before your mom? You ask Google. Moving down to heart, as a species, we need to love and we need to be loved. Kids that receive great nutrition and no affection aren't as healthy as kids that receive poor nutrition but a lot of affection. Fastest way to 100 years of age is to increase the number of people in your life that you love or specifically that you care for. And Facebook has tapped into that need, creating more connections, more empathy, and is helping us love at scale. Consumption. More people have died in our species over the course of the last several million years from starvation than any other ailment. So it's hardwired into us one basic instinct, one basic word, more. You can never get enough. Open your cupboard, open your closet, look at uh, your car and the features you want and think are worth the money. 
and you'll realize that about 96, 97 percent of everything in your life is excess beyond really what is required. And yet almost all of us, almost all of us, regardless of how evolved and how rational we are, never sate that need for more. Because starvation is an ugly death. It's happened a long time to a lot of us. And so the notion of having more is much safer and a much lower risk than having less. And Amazon hits that need. Amazon is our consumptive track. It's our digestive track. We take in stuff. The strategy of more for less is always a winning strategy. It's the strategy of China. And Amazon has tapped into this strategy and this basic instinct of needing more. And then once we survive, we go to the next basic instinct, the second most powerful instinct, and that's to propagate. And our desire to be more attractive to the other sex, our desire to signal strength, speed, and intelligence such that we can spread our seed to the four corners of the earth as men, and such that as women, we can put up a finer filter and pick the strongest, smartest, and fastest seed, which is the basis of all evolutionary progress, is what luxury taps into. And because it's the most irrational of the organs, we translate that to margins. Irrational purchases translates to margin, translates to shareholder value. And as you move down the torso, you get more and more irrational decision making, which translates to this wonderful thing called margin and shareholder value. And with Apple, we have the most profitable company in the world that has operating margins between Hermes and Ferrari. Again, two brands that signal to the other sex. So these four combined have disarticulated who we are. When you think about God, when you think about love, when you think about consumption, when you think about sex, think about who you are as an individual. And you're probably a function of those four things. The ratio and the approach to each of those four things define who you are as a person. And these companies have taken each of those things, disarticulated them, and then reassembled them in a form of a Delaware corporation such that they could capture economic value from those four things. And as a result, we see power and economic value aggregate that we've never seen before among four entities this fast. Just 2008, the market capitalization of these four companies was equal to the GDP of Poland, 2009 Portugal, 10 Nigeria, 11 Argentina, 12 Turkey, 13 Indonesia, 14 Mexico, 15. The market capitalization of these companies surpassed the GDP of Russia. In 2016, it's hitting Canada. And next year, it's likely going to surpass the market capitalization of India. Or put another way, there are only six nations in the world that have market capitalization, excuse me, that have GDP greater than the market capitalization of these four companies. And this is not an apples to apples comparison, obviously, but it gives you a sense for the kind of economic value that's been created across these four entities. Now, there's a huge amount of controversy over whether these four companies are getting too powerful. And the only safety from these companies taking over the world is not regulators who have proven they're somewhat anemic or flaccid in their attempt to regulate these companies because everybody wants to be seen hanging out with the hot guy or the hot girl. And these four companies represent a gross idolatry of youth that we have never seen before in terms of our ability to make irrational decisions uh, such that we treat them differently. We have a different relationship with them than every other kid in the high school. The safety, well, I believe the only safety, is that the four fortunately hate each other. And what we've seen over the last 24 to 36 months is they're starting to encroach on each other's territory. And they all wake up and think there can only be one. And they're starting to go after each other's business. And it's a good thing. It's a good thing economically, and it's a good thing competitively. And one is winning. When you think about where these four overlap and look at those areas of conflict, in almost each case, there's one company coming out on top in its overlap of the Venn diagram as it goes up against the other three. Let's talk about hardware. Apple's the most innovative hardware company in history. But the last two years, would it be the Apple Watch? Would it be the Apple Pods? It would be the hardware innovation of 15 and 16? No, it would be Amazon's Alexa. Over the last 24 months, Amazon is arguably the most innovative hardware company in the world. In voice, if someone had said a few years ago, voice is going to take off, it's going to be very important, what company do you think will have the lead in voice recognition technology? Would you have guessed Amazon? I think most people would have guessed Apple, then probably Google. Yet Amazon has taken the lead in voice. In digital marketing, it has been a story of Facebook and Google. But as we're going to see, Amazon is starting to eat into Facebook and Google's duopoly 
of digital marketing. This is a big business for them that no one talks about. So the new one is Amazon. And it's going to be very interesting how these companies respond to one of them going up against all three of them and beating them. So some stats on just how dominant Apple, uh, Amazon is. So we have $92 billion in US holiday shopping. That's an 11% increase from 15. 18 billion singles day from Alibaba. Think about that, $18 billion on one day, 24% increase. $3.5 billion Cyber Monday, that was up 12% this year. 3.3 billion is purchased on Black Friday, up 22%. And then Amazon had their Prime Day, they're copying Alibaba's singles day, and did 1 billion this year, which isn't even in the same realm as Singles Day. However, it was up 60% this year. So the fastest growing consumer or consumption holiday or day in the world is owned by one company, Amazon. Now pity Walmart. Pity how difficult it is to be anyone going up against a company that has infinitely cheaper capital than you. You are diving underwater and fighting a war underwater. The only difference is you have an oxygen tank the size of a Coke can, and you're competing with an enemy that has an oxygen tank the size of a dump truck. They just have more capital and it's cheaper. So they can fight unfair. They can do things over and over. They can do things at a scale you can't match because of this cheaper capital. In the last five years, we've seen Walmart add $137 billion of top line revenue. Excuse me, in the last 10 years, they've added $137 billion in top line revenue. And that has resulted in an increase in market capitalization of $36 billion. They add $140 billion in top line revenue. They increase the value of the firm, or the marketplace says, OK, you're worth $37 billion more. Amazon has added $121 billion and increased their market cap by two Walmarts. So every time Amazon increases their incremental revenue by a dollar, the market says, thanks very much and gives them another 2 to $3. And every time Walmart figures out a way to increase their market cap by a dollar, the marketplace gives them a dime. Amazon is effectively just overwhelming the competition. Uh, I'm a war history buff at the end of World War II. Uh, the Germans had uh, better troops. They were better trained troops. In terms of a kill ratio, German soldiers were much better than any other, any other army. They had better technology. The jet engines we enjoy today, silly putty, the leather jacket, all innovation from the German army. Uh, the panzer tank could effectively deflect missiles. You couldn't kill a panzer tank from the left, the right, or the front. Missiles literally bounced off of it. However, however, towards the end of the world, the Allies had 38 gallons of gasoline for every one gallon Amazon, uh, for every one gallon, uh, uh, for every one gallon uh, the Germans had. And we would literally surround the panzer tanks with five or six Bradley tanks because there wasn't enough gasoline for the panzer tanks. And we would sneak up behind the thing and basically run the panzer tank down and then wait till we were behind the thing and then shoot it in its vulnerable area. Amazon is the retailer with 38 gallons of gasoline. And that any category they go into, they can just overwhelm with brute force, regardless if you're better, regardless if you have better morale, regardless if you have better tanks. They have 38 gallons of gasoline. Search. Search is Google, right? Doesn't Google own search? From 15 to 16, 44% of all searches on the web for products started on Amazon. Wow, that's incredible. Not as incredible as a year later, where it grew to 55%. So Amazon's share of search in a key category that's going to garner a lot of very expensive bids from marketers grew 25% year on year. Amazon is a search engine with a warehouse attached to it and is a viable competitor to Google in the world of search. If we didn't think of Amazon as a retailer, people would be talking about Amazon as a direct threat to Google in the form of search. We've seen unbelievable revenue growth. Uh, in the last several years, Amazon has added the uh, revenues of Nordstrom, Macy's, and Sears to its top line. Retail is a difficult business. Services are a difficult business. For those of you who are in a business where every January 1, you start your business over, and you wake up in the morning, and you think, how do I recreate my business? How do I go from a dollar to a dollar six this year, or a dollar 12, or a dollar 20? 
Those are difficult businesses. And most of us are in the business of recreating our businesses every year. So as a result, businesses that have to recreate or reanimate themselves every year, whether you're an ad agency or a retailer, we're valued at a multiple of EBITDA. The first company I started, Profit Brand Strategy, was a consulting firm. And every year I'd wake up January 1 and think, how do we recreate this business plus 20% or plus 30%? And then technology figured out, that's a bad business model. Let's figure out, let's make a massive investment up front and offer people an amazing product at an amazing price that locks them in and integrates into their daily workflow such that we become indispensable in their workflow in, the, in their workflow, and the renewal rates or the annual fees we charge them become greater. That's why real estate gets such an incredible value and holds so much economic value for so long, because recurring revenue is just a better business model. And Amazon decided they wanted out of the business of traditional retail and stopping and starting every January 1, and they wanted to get into renewal, uh, revenue renewal business. And that's what Prime is. Prime has effectively taken one of the, the fastest growing retail in the world and turned it into a software-like business model where you have an ongoing annual relationship, and they're creating hooks into, into homes that is stronger than SAP or Oracle or Microsoft ever had in terms of your willingness and your need to renew that recurring revenue relationship. So in the US, 44% of US households own a gun, 49% have a landline phone, 51% attend church monthly. I think these are the same people. By the way, that's my, that's my geography test. London, San Francisco, New York, that joke goes over really well. Uh, Nashville and Houston, not so much. 55% uh, of U US households earn over $50,000 a year. 55% of US households voted in the election. 58% of US households now have a uh, prime. Nobody could have guessed that the manifestation or the biggest shift in technology the last 10 years would be that people would replace their cable line with a cable pipe of stuff. And that's effectively what Amazon Prime is. It's trying to create a cable pipe of stuff into every household and other things and create an economic recurring revenue relationship with the wealthiest households in the world. And 78% decorated Christmas tree. <laughs> The new core competence in business is storytelling. Think about every media company, the Wall Street Journal, the Financial Times, Business Insider. It's basically a megaphone for one of these four companies who steal the mic from every other company and constantly put out press releases about all the new innovation they're doing. What drones? Are we ever going to do that? Maybe, maybe not. Not at least for five years. That's OK. Invite 60 minutes in it. We're Amazon. They'll talk about anything. And it'll be on the front page everywhere. And by the way, no other retailer is going to have any space on the front page, because next week we're going to put out another press release. And the innovator, or the perception of being the innovator, results in an additional turn on EBITDA and greater profitability, which creates lower capital, which creates the ability to become the innovator. So these companies have turned into storytellers and are fantastic at owning the narrative and being seen as the most innovative companies in the world. And we throw money at them to make that a self-fulfilling prophecy. No profits at Amazon. This has also been a huge shift in our economy. I think probably the biggest shift in the gestalt of startups has been that everyone is trying to mimic Amazon and has replaced profits with leadership and vision. And the new black are losses. So if you look at the big four, pretty profitable with the exception of Amazon. And Amazon has now taught everybody to look for companies that establish leadership and vision regardless of whether they're making money or not. And by the way, I don't think this ends well. I think this is strange. When we started L2, um, I was used to profit. I was used to a services company. Grow 30% a year and try and maintain 30, try and maintain 30 to 40% EBITDA margins. That's how sort of, I'm built as a, as a manager. And then our VCs came in and said, you got it all wrong. Go to 20 or 30% negative EBITDA and grow 70% a year and establish yourself as the leader. And it felt physically uncomfortable to do that, to spend that aggressively and see that much money being spent for additional growth. And it was the right move. It was absolutely the way to ex exponentially increase our value in the marketplace. Because investors and the marketplace want to see leadership. And if you're a company, they don't really care. Or if you've established leadership, they forgive you not only for not making any money, but for tremendous losses. But profits are like heroin to an addict. And once you go there and give the addict the heroin, there's no taking it away. 
And so a lot of companies are now trapped in this unfortunate box called profitability. And it's that they're not allowed to compete with other companies who are spending everything and more on innovation. So look at some of the new players. WeWork, 500 million in revenues, break even. Snapchat, 400 million in revenues and a half a billion dollars in losses. A 27-year-old who's created three classes of stock so that anyone who buys a share of Snapchat has no rights to the company. The most agile resource company in the world trying to kill it, right? And a company now worth more than Viacom and the New York Times combined, even with its 40% decline in its stock price. Uber, $6 billion in revenues, $3 billion in losses. If you took an Uber from uptown today and it cost you $20 or $30, it cost Uber $45. It is economically irresponsible not to take Uber everywhere. <laughs> and then there's Netflix. How could Netflix not be massively profitable given their growth? Because they keep increasing their content budgets. Watching Amazon have said, you screwed up. If you're profitable, we aren't investing enough. So every time Reed Hastings management team come, comes into a room and they say, it looks like we're going to make money this quarter. You screwed up. Spend more on content, spend more on technology, hire more smart people. Because like Amazon, we need to be the growth and the visionary leader, not the profit leader. This is a very strange economic construct. I don't think we've ever been in this territory before. Maybe, maybe in 1999, but I don't think we've seen these kind of losses rack up across the leaders. Amazon employs more people uh, combined than the other three because it's a retail company and they have a lot of people in their warehouses. A lot of people would argue these aren't, these aren't employees, they're contractors, and it's not apples to apples. However, they're much more efficient. They create $1.2 million in market capitalization for every person they hire. The number one recruiter at Stern five to seven years ago was American Express. Now, hands down, the number one recruiter at Stern is Amazon. And kids come to my office hours. Nobody ever wants to talk about brand strategy, digital marketing. They just want to talk about their careers. And they'll say, I have an, I have an offer from this company. I have an offer from Macy's. I have an offer from The Limited. Or I have an offer from this great company in my hometown. And I get to be near my parents. And I have an offer from Amazon. And they go through this hand wringing. And I let them sit there. And I'm like, just don't waste my time. You're going to Seattle. Uh, you know, let's, we can, if you need this therapy, we can go through this game. But you're going to go to Seattle. And that's the right move. It's the most respected training ground. It's the equivalent of a second MBA to go to Amazon. There's no company in the world that calls you in for an interview and goes, oh, you worked at Amazon the last five years. No, nah, we're just not interested in that skill set. <laughs> we believe Amazon is going to be the first uh, private company or the first, the first um, for-profit company, technically, that is going to reach a trillion dollars in value. Now, how's it going to get there? Most people think, well, it's a retailer. It's going to get there through retail. It's going to get there one of several ways. One, it's going after cloud computing. Two, it's going to figure out an economic model around retail as it relates to voice. It's also becoming a player in digital marketing, over-the-top streaming, hardware, logistics. There's $150 to $200 billion in market cap from UPS, FedEx, and DHL who have not innovated in 20 years, yet their prices have gone up 84% in the last eight years, which means they're fairly ripe to be disrupted. And imagine a person not in a FedEx or a Brown uniform, but in an Amazon uniform that's supported by warehouses, uh, 757s, tractor trailers, your purchase history, and artificial intelligence. Are you going to spend more than a second evaluating who you would rather have or if you're comfortable with overnight delivery from Amazon as opposed to FedEx, DHL, or UPS? I think you're going to see tremendous market capitalization leak from the overnight guys to these guys. And you can go across every one of these categories and identify somewhere between $100 billion and a half a trillion dollars in market cap across several companies. And then look at what Amazon is doing in that area. And then you're going to look at it and go, I'm betting on Amazon. And even if they only win in three of six of those categories, they're going to get to a trillion dollars in market cap. Cloud computing is probably the fastest growing area of technology and also probably the most profitable, defying gravity in that it's growing really fast yet maintaining margins. And who's the leader in cloud? Amazon. Every day, Amazon adds more cloud capacity than they needed when they started the business 10 years ago. 
their entire, they, they started this business to support their own processing needs. But when they started the business, the entire year of their needs is now added every day in terms of their capacity around their cloud computing offering. It's also the most profitable part of their business. It's probably going to be as profitable as the rest of the business entirely. I actually think this is a problem for Amazon because despite their best efforts, they're gonna to have to be profitable, which is an issue for them because this is a very profitable business. Voice, a third of all commands likely in the next several years will originate from voice as opposed to a keyboard. And one company owns voice, two thirds of share of voice is now from Amazon. How do they use the Echo? Mostly for basics. Where are they headed with this? We believe they're gonna head full force into brand and believe that Echo and voice is the worst thing to happen to brand since World War II. There is this basic reflex reaction, almost instinct in marketing departments at business schools that brand as a strategy is a winning strategy. Develop an average product, an average shoe, an average drink, an average service, create tight brand codes, wrap the product, wrap the brand codes around this product, and then pound away at those brand associations with really cheap and really efficient broadcast media. <clears throat> I don't think that's the right strategy anymore. I think that strategy is over. And we began, we've literally taken it as conventional wisdom that that's always a winning strategy. And we're starting to see a crumbling of the advertising industrial complex based on that algorithm of value post-World War II, of an average product with a great brand associations lends itself to irrational margins. And Amazon is conspiring with 500 million consumers, voice, technology, your purchase history, artificial intelligence, and fanatical investors giving it almost infinite capital to starch the margin from brands and give it back to you. So what happens when you want to buy batteries with Alexa? You buy batteries. Amazon, I want to buy batteries, it makes suggestions. And it's suggestions, and it'll make two, maybe three, are for Amazon Basics or Amazon Elements, basically Amazon's private label. And it, then Alex will say, I'm done. That's all I have. I'm out of ideas. But then if you go online, you find that Alexa has a selective memory, that Amazon, in fact, does carry several battery brands. But without the benefit of packaging, without the benefit of pricing, Sunday inserts, end caps, eye level, partnerships with the retailer, these are things that CPG brands and traditional brands have spent decades and tens of billions of dollars establishing. Voice literally obviates all of those things. And Amazon has said, with voice, Mr. Consumer, Mrs. Consumer, Mrs. Investor, I'll take that 50, 60, 80 points of gross margin that P&G and Unilever and maybe even LVMH and Estee Lauder are getting, and I'm gonna give it back to you, because I'm gonna use algorithms to trade them off against each other every nanosecond and slowly but surely drive the margin from every single consumer product company brand. I think Amazon, I love it when people say they partner with Amazon, or Amazon calls like every platform, they partner with their brands. I think Amazon partners with brands like a virus partners with a host. I think it's, <laughs> I think it's effectively a one-way relationship. If you ask Alexa for detergent, it recommends their house label Presto, even though the algorithm would tell you to order Tide, which has better user reviews and is a better deal. Now, a retailer trading brands off for private label is nothing new. We've just never seen anyone this good at it. Digital marketing. 3,500 companies financed, all being eaten alive by two companies, Facebook and Google. I think that 3,500 companies in digital marketing that aren't Facebook or Google are now Amazon. It's like being in a pit of death. Humidity, anxiety, and death. 103% of the growth captured by Amazon, Facebook, and Google in digital marketing. So all those people meeting with you at video optimization platforms are great at optimizing your banner ads. Join, they join magazines and newspapers in that they're in an industry that is now in structural decline. Kids, again, come to my office hours and think about working in digital marketing. A great business, as long as you work for Facebook, Google, or Amazon. Otherwise, you're in a business in decline. Amazon Media Group does, we believe, about $400 million in profit, did a billion and a half revenue this year, is four times the size of Snap, and probably within 12 to 24 months will surpass Twitter in terms of revenue derived from digital marketing. 
over the top streaming. This is what you can do when you have 38 gallons of gasoline. You can go into original video content, an adjacent business that isn't even your core business, and you can invest more than NBC, ABC, or HBO only behind Netflix. By the way, Netflix increased their original content budget two billion dollars when they learned that Amazon was spending four and a half billion dollars on original content. So while Amazon isn't thought of as a big player in the world of broadcast or over-the-top streaming, they're about to. They may not even be as good as HBO. They're clearly not as good as HBO. They don't need to be. They just have more capital, and they'll eventually figure it out. They're also allowing producers, they're attacking in two ways. Typically, when you're a content producer or a production company, you end up with 10 cents on the dollar. If you produce Modern Family, a Modern Family, ABC can produce a dollar in advertising content, about 10 cents flows back to the original content provider or production company. Amazon is now saying, we'll give content providers 50% of all the revenue we create in terms of advertising, or we'll give them 15 cents per streaming mi minute. So they're going after the content producers now and say, you want to be on Prime. You want to be in our video platform because you're going to have access to the wealthiest households. And bottom line is, we're just going to pay you more. So you're going to see more and more original content, not only that Amazon pays for, but it's just put on the platform by content providers who have figured out Amazon's cut out the middleman, is more efficient, and can afford to lose money by attracting more and more content. So this is where Amazon was in terms of share of peak viewing hours, in terms of over-the-top streaming, as you can tell in 2015. Barely a blip. But watch what happened just in 12 months. Right? We know Netflix is number one. YouTube's number two. Amazon is now number three. How long will it be with that 38 gallons of gasoline before Amazon begins to threaten Netflix. They're almost there in terms of spending on original content. You're going to see an unbelievable decline. And I've been saying this for five years, and I've been wrong for five years, but a decline of broadcast, traditional broadcast media. The only thing keeping broadcast media alive right now is sports. If you took away sports and viewership, you'd have massive declines in viewership across these companies. And the thing about sports is you can't own it. It goes to the highest bidder. One year, the Olympics, the World Cup, go to ABC, then it goes to Fox. So these really aren't proprietary advantages. There's nothing, there, there's no competence building here. There's nothing that it does to your culture that's sustainable. You're just the highest bidder at that moment. But it has been the last firewall of broadcast media. So clearly what's going to happen in the next 12 to 24 months, we're going to see the Super Bowl, the Olympics, or March Madness go to Facebook, Google, maybe even Twitter, or more likely Amazon. Why? They have a bigger checkbook. They're going to start buying these and spreading it across their platforms and their user base. Hardware, Alexa is the hardware innovation of the last few years. The Amazon Fire gets more reviews than any other hardware product on Amazon. Logistics, they're creating an unbelievable back-end logistics uh, platform that they can sell into other uh, retailers trying to get into those, those uh, households that are the wealthiest house households in the world. They filed more patents than almost any other logistics company. 757s, tractor trailers. Amazon has co-opted the post office and said, this is a great deal for us. They're losing money subsidized by taxpayers, and we'll give them gross margin or incremental revenue that has very high gross margin by leasing this vast network that taxpayers play for and operating it on a Sunday. So our tax dollars are somewhat subsidizing Amazon's back end because Amazon has figured out a way to leverage this infrastructure on Sundays. And if you see a USPS truck on a Sunday, it's effectively an Amazon truck. So what's next? Amazon has now decided, well, we live in an app of mobile economy in five of the ten, top 10 apps where consumers spend 80% of their time on mobile uh, on apps is messaging. So what did they announce two days ago? They're going to get into the messaging game, directly going after Facebook. None of the other three, none of the other four, I should say, are this aggressively going after each other and across each point of contact winning. So each of these four, there's a great scene, or uh, I think a decent scene in Star Wars, I forget which one it is, where young Darth Vader decides, is told to kill all the young Padawans. And he goes in and he kills all, all, the, all the kids with the Force or that are adept with the Force. And we're seeing this. The four basically identify any threat that's not willing to sell to them or that they don't want to buy or that's a nuisance, becomes more of a nuisance, becomes upgrades to a bother. And they can put them out of business just with a press release. Amazon puts out a press release and a picture that they're going into ready cooked meals and Blue Apron drops like a stone that day. Just a press release. 
Facebook is blowing by Snap with Instagram stories. Everyone was hoping Snapchat would be the third player in the ecosystem and that Snap would be the Facebook of video. The Facebook of video is Facebook, specifically, <laughs> specifically Instagram stories that is besting Snap on almost every metric. Apple has already put every wearable company out of business. It's just a matter of time. Jawbone announced they were going out of business a couple weeks ago. Fitbit will be next. So we have a new order. And with these four companies, I think it's important that we acknowledge um, with, that with great power comes great responsibility. But with each of these companies, I think there's a decent argument that instead of responsibility, power corrupts. They're not bad people. But in general, throughout history, power does corrupt. And we've seen a tremendous amount of negligence from each of these four companies, in my view. And this is where it's fun to be in a university environment. And, and quote unquote, uh, do your best to pursue the truth. This is not a good commercial move for us to talk about how these four companies are negligent. So if I'm pulled over and suspected of driving under the influence of alcohol, I can be strapped down to a chair and have blood taken from me against my will. If your spouse shows up dead, the first thing they do is get a court order, come into your house and get your computer. And by the way, look at your search history. That's the first thing they look at and also search your house. But if a terrorist shoots 17 people, and they know that's the individual that shot these people, and they get his phone, don't shut the phone. Phone's sacred, right? The iPhone is sacred. Your person, your home, that's not sacred. We can get into that in a couple hours of the court order. But Apple's decided that no, this is the cross. We had our Jesus Christ, Steve Jobs, and now the iPhone is our cross, and it's holy, and don't touch it. It is ridiculous. What if that terrorist mobile device had been a BlackBerry? Do you think we would have put up with that if Rim out of a Waterloo, Canada had said, we're taking a stand for privacy on behalf of all consumers, <laughs> and you, American FBI, we, don't, we could let you into the BlackBerry, and there could be another t impending attack in the next 24 hours, but we've decided to take a stand from Waterloo, Canada on behalf of privacy for all citizens. There would have been a trade embargo on the floor of Congress within 24 hours. But we've decided that Apple is holy. Facebook is not a media company. It's a platform, because media companies have responsibility. Media companies, the general compact media companies have with society is, with great power comes some responsibility. And we have some onus to, to, to ensure that what we're putting out has some veracity, some credibility, maybe even spend some money on fact checking. And so Facebook decided, I know what we'll do. We're not a media company. It's not that we create content and sell advertising against it to make money, which traditionally defines a media company. We're a platform. And thus, it obviates us from the responsibility of ensuring what is, the content is on our platform is true. So seven, 10 days before the election, the majority of the news from where 80% of Americans get their news now, their social media feeds, is fake news. Now, what would happen if McDonald's, it was found after the election, that the week before the election, 80% of the beef they had been serving was fake. And it had been giving people encephalitis, and their brain had swollen, and they started making bad decisions. <laughs> and then after the election, we went back and said, McDonald's, we're really upset with you. 80% of the beef you were serving was fake, and it led to bad decisions that is really bad for our society. And McDonald's said, whoa, 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 hold on. We're not a fast food restaurant. We're a fast food platform. <laughs> Facebook and Google have really let us down. They have, committed, they have committed involuntary manslaughter of the truth on an unprecedented scale. People are going to start connecting the dots and realizing these amazing companies are just more efficient than their old economy peers. And there's tremendous job destruction taking place. And we get cold comfort in low unemployment rates. But what I think you effectively see happening is an arbitrage down of people who used to have good middle class jobs to TaskRabbit or Uber. So you see, even despite economic growth, you see wage stagnation. So to get $20 billion in retail services accomplished with Amazon, they're going to need an additional 50,000 employees. But that $20 billion coming out of the retail ecosystem is going to result in destruction of 103,000 jobs or a net loss of 53,000 jobs. Or you could fill Yankee Stadium this year with merchants, buyers, uh, window dressers, cashiers, and say, courtesy of Amazon, you're out of business. 
It's even worse in the media business to service the $20 billion in incremental revenue that Facebook and Google this year will do or capture from the rest of the ecosystem. And by the way, the media ecosystem is flat. It's not a growth business. They'll need another 14,000 employees. But the traditional players, the traditional services companies in the media ecosystem needed 151,000 people to service that $20 billion. So you're talking about a net loss of 137,000 jobs in the media ecosystem, courtesy of Facebook, Google, and now Amazon, or two and a half Yankee stadiums full of strategists, planners, copywriters, creative executives. All of your friends that we used to admire, who wore black and got to do cool stuff with clients and came up with big ideas, a lot of them are gonna to decide to spend more time with their families in the next few years. I also believe these companies wrap themselves in a pink or a rainbow blanket to come across as more progressive. Why? It's to their advantage from a shareholder perspective. Because as progressives, we're largely perceived as nice yet weak. So we're less threatened by companies that are run by people who are perceived as progressives. So while I believe all these people generally are progressives, I'm not questioning their beliefs. I think it is a good idea from a shareholder perspective to fly Sheryl Sandberg to Cannes, which they did, have her speak to 400 leading executives of ad agencies, female executives, about leaning in, about the very important conversation around women in the workplace. It's, that's an, an important dialogue we need to have. But I also think it's a bit of an illusionist trick because I think it's Facebook saying, hey, look over here and ignore the fact that the people Cheryl is inspiring in the audience, we're going to put 30% of them out of work in the next 24 months. This is who they really are. <laughs> now, don't these companies, don't we need innovators? Don't we need them? Don't they do a lot of good things? Sure. Fantastic for the US. Fantastic in terms of owning real estate in San Francisco or the Ferrari dealership in Portola Valley, or if you work at these companies, they're inspiring. There's a lot of great things about these companies. But what about taxes? Who pays for our soldiers, our nurses, our roads? The average S&P 500 company paid 27% of its profits in taxes. This is what the four paid. Why? Because we allow them to transfer their capital or their profits to tax havens that suppress their profits in high tax areas and raise them in low tax areas, thereby bringing down their average tax rate. And no legislator or no lawmaker wants to go after them because everybody wants to hang out with a hot girl. Everybody wants to be friends with the hot guy. Right? You're not innovative. You don't get it if you go after these companies. Facebook gets fined $122 million for lying, saying when EU regulators say, we're worried you could share all this information across the half a billion people using WhatsApp and use it to threaten privacy concerns across the Facebook platform. We don't like the idea of all this data being in one place. And Facebook says, it would be literally impossible for us to figure this out within several years. OK, fine. We believe you. We'll approve the merger. We'll approve the $20 billion acquisition of WhatsApp. And then guess what? They figure it out. And the regulators say, you know what? You lied to us. We're angry, so we're finding you $122 million, which is the equivalent of 0.6% of the value that Facebook put on WhatsApp. So what regulators and we as a society are saying to these companies is that the smart thing to do is to lie to us. This is the equivalent of having a parking meter that costs $100 an hour, but if you refuse to pay the meter, you get a ticket for 50 cents. The smart thing to do is to break the law. Now, what we're starting to see in the EU is there's one regulator there whose testicles appear to have descended <laughs> and has decided that she is going to start fining companies at a level that they begin to notice. But still, does this really matter? Does Google really care that they're fined $2.7 billion in exchange for going full force at every decision they want, regardless of antitrust, privacy concerns? So, Amazon will make a transformative brick and mortar acquisition in the next 12 months because they have no choice. This, by the way, this is me gloating. <laughs> My prediction is that Amazon will acquire uh, an organization like a Whole Foods or a Wegmans as they have not figured out grocery.
By the way, I want to apologize for having a picture of me above me. That's like shavings of shit on a shit salad. <laughs> Uh, this is five days before Amazon announced the acquisition of Whole Foods. I still believe they're going to buy a Macy's or a Carrefour or something like that. You know, I, I, I can't imagine why they wouldn't buy Whole Foods, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, just Now, what happens the day they announce? The marketplace says, this is a great idea. As a matter of fact, we like it so much, we'll pay for it for you. And Amazon's stock goes up the day of the announcement more than the acquisition price. And they say to every other retailer, we're so pissed off that you're not Amazon and you're not bold like Amazon. We're going to make you pay for the price of Amazon to buy Whole Foods. And the market cap decline of every other grocer that didn't make this bold move is hammered more than the acquisition price. So Amazon putting out a press release gets this acquisition paid for by other retailers. I believe that CPG companies are going to need to forward integrate into retail and the opportunity is for these companies to do what LVMH did and Apple did and do this crazy move of forward integrating into retail. As brand building gets harder and harder pre-broadcast because wealthy young people opt out of the advertising industrial complex, advertising has become a tax that the poor and the technologically illiterate pay. We're opting out of it. So the only way to reach people is at the point of purchase. You're going to see the best companies with high margins, whether it's Nike, Rolex, or Samsung, have to forward integrate into retail, into point of purchase. Otherwise, their margins are going to decline. I also think there's a big opportunity because retail has been hammered so hard. It's so much cheaper than buying other growth brands, which is currently, currently what they're doing. So the question is, how did we know? Amazon had never made an acquisition more than a billion dollars. They made an acquisition of $13.5 billion, and we predicted it literally seven days before it happened. How did we know? And I'm about to let you in on how this actually went down, on how this happened. So we're testing Alexa. We're, we're hurling thousands of commands at Alexa every day in the office and taking notes to try and figure out what is Amazon's strategy with Alexa. And we're in there, and I'm playing with Alexa, and I said, OK, Alexa, buy whole milk. Alexa, buy whole milk. I couldn't find anything for whole milk, so I've added whole milk to your shopping list. OK, and then I said, Alexa, Buy organic foods. Alexa, buy organic foods. The top search result for organic food is Plum Organics Baby Food, Banana, and Pumpkin, 12 pack of four ounces each. It's $15 total. Would you like to buy it? And then, as often happens now at my age, I got a little bit confused and I blurted out something I didn't mean to. Alexa, <laughs> buy whole foods. I have purchased the outstanding stock of Whole Foods Incorporated at $42 per share. I have charged $13.7 billion to your American Express card. I thought that was going to be funnier. <laughs> so our prediction, Amazon is the first trillion dollar company, but don't celebrate yet. A district attorney in a state's office is going to start to connect the docs between job loss. People are going to get increasingly pissed off at the continued illusionist tricks of these four companies, get angry at Amazon, and this district attorney is going to realize the fastest blue line path to the governor's mansion is to go after Amazon. Amazon by 2020, first trillion dollar company, and then soon after, it'll be broken up. Our next speaker. <laughs>